and welcome to Mint. I'm Nasreen Sultana. After the Finance Minister Nirmala Sitharaman's tax proposal in the budget, there seems to be a confusion among investors. Uh, there is, uh, she has proposed a lot of uh, new taxation on uh, HNIs. There is an increase in the public float. To, to understand how this taxation will work for investors, I'm joined by Mr. Rajesh Gandhi. He is the partner at Deloitte India to take us through all the tax details proposed by uh, Finance Minister Nirmala Nirmala Sitharaman in the budget. Uh, so, Mr. Uh, Gandhi, uh, what is your takeaway from the budget this year? Uh, I think in an overall perspective, it's not a, a big bank budget. There have been some tweaks here and there in terms of policy announcements, tax changes. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think there are a couple of reasons for that. One is that the government has been in place very recently. So, they didn't have uh, you know, much time mm -hmm. to look at all the proposals and tax changes in a holistic manner. Mm -hmm. And again, and the second thing is from a tax point of view, we will also have a direct tax code coming in. Mm. Uh, discussions are already in vain that there's a committee set up. So we will see probably more changes in the direct tax code. Mm. Uh, I think in the budget next year in 2020 Feb, we'll probably see some more announcements coming in from the government because they'll have more time to deliberate on mm. various things, look at industry representations, mm -hmm. look at the committee recommendations on the direct tax code. Right. So, uh, there seems to be a lot of confusion about the increased uh, uh, in, the, in the income tax surcharge uh, of, of the HNIs. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, how do you interpret that? Uh, because uh, the, the FPIs were really concerned. Right. So, first of all, uh, to clarify the law, the increase in surcharge applies to all taxpayers who are not corporates and partnerships. Mm -hmm. And as you rightly said, it seems to me the intention of the government was to tax the ultra high rich, the HNIs, mm. etc. by increasing the surcharge mm. up right up to 37% mm. for income above 5 crores. But what has happened is because the way the Indian tax law is bracketed, all taxpayers who are not corporates and partnerships, they come under a, come under a separate slab. Right. So which means it covers not only individuals but other forms of taxpayers like a trust mm. or an association of persons, etc. Now, therefore, the downside of this proposal is that it brings into fold in this increased tax rate all other kinds of taxpayers like a trust which is set up offshore as an FPI, an AIF which is set up in India mostly as a trust, REITs in which all of these have, have come under the fold. And as you can see from the press reports and the noise which is made in the last two days, there have been, and the government itself seems to have admitted that almost 35 to 40 percent of the total FPIs in India are set up as trusts. Mm. So of course there's a significant impact for them. Just to give the numbers, for example, for derivative income, mm. the tax rate will increase from around 35% including surcharge mm. to almost 42%. Right. Which is, you know, almost 40% of your income gets shaved off exactly. as taxes. Mm -hmm. Similarly for short term gains, the rate increases from 17 to 21, 21 and a half. Mm. So quite a significant impact mm -hmm. for FPIs and being the fund industry, you know, there might be between April and now, there might be a situation where investors would have already exited. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how do you recover taxes mm -hmm. from those investors? Because the law applies from April 1. Mm -hmm. So, there is some amount of concern in the community. Right, right. Uh, just to deviate from the proposal, I uh, want to understand from you, uh, globally, what is the taxation for, the, for this category of uh, income earners? Yeah, so you know, globally it depends because in most of the jurisdictions, mm. if you are investing offshore, mm. then you are not taxed in the source country in which you are investing. Mm -hmm. So whether you take most of the European countries, you take China for example, China is a good comparison for India, in Singapore, Hong Kong, if you are an offshore investor, you, that country doesn't tax you. It's only certain Asian countries like India, Pakistan, Taiwan, Korea mm -hmm. uh, and Brazil which levy a source country taxation. Right. And India is kind of at the medium to higher level on that. Right, okay. So uh, in the budget, there was another tax uh, proposal made by the FM uh, on the buyback. Yeah. Uh, how do you see that impacting uh, you know, companies? Because we have seen a slew of buybacks in the last few years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, on that, you know, I think it will increase the cost for companies wanting to return uh, profits back to the investors. Right because the buyback was a pretty good way to give a tax efficient return to the investors. You know, the investor would pay a 10 or 15 percent tax on the buyback. Mm. Whereas if there was a dividend, they would have paid a 20 percent tax. Mm. 
uh, but the government for some reason felt that that's a loophole which would be exploited by some people. Mm-hmm. In fact, I was just looking at some numbers. In this year alone, almost nine billion dollars worth of buyback have been either yes. done or planned. Mm-hmm. So that's a significant amount of taxes mm-hmm. which the government hopes to collect. Mm-hmm. I would think more and more companies would want to do a dividend distribution now mm-hmm. after this law change mm-hmm. because buyback from a regulatory point of view is a cumbersome process. Mm-hmm. Unless somebody wants to alter their promoter holding, reduce capital genuinely, mm-hmm. I think the use of buyback will reduce. Mm-hmm. And I think the other challenge is there have been some companies like Infosys mm. who have planned the buyback in the last uh, few months. Right. Uh, the fact that they are now going to make the payment after July 5th mm. in the budget date, mm-hmm. they will also be hit by this regime. Mm-hmm. So it changes the whole dynamics and calculations. Mm-hmm. Maybe I think the government should give some leeway for those companies which had proposed the buyback before the budget but they're making the payment. But there is no clarity on how it's going to be imposed on the uh, on the ongoing buybacks or uh, those which have been announced after 5th of July, isn't it? Yeah, the, the way if you read the law right mm-hmm. now, it applies to all payments which are made after 5th of July. Okay, even, so even the ongoing existing ones. ongoing ones. Well. Okay, okay, okay. But there is no clarity coming from the government or or do you think uh, anything that ha- was happening after, what has been happening after July 5th will be taxed? So I don't, uh, whatever I know a little bit, I don't think there's been any discussion happening uh, at the government level Mm -hmm. but ideally they should be clarifying in one way or the other to say that Mm -hmm. either it will apply to existing buybacks or not. Right. So another tax proposal that uh, was made by the FM is on the STT uh, on the derivative market. So how do you think it's going to impact the market or the sentiments? Right. So on the STT, uh, just to clarify what the provision today is, there's a 0.125% surcharge Mm -hmm levied on option contracts at the entire settlement price Mm -hmm. which is the gross value of the contract. Now this was significantly increasing the tax cost Mm -hmm. of doing an option contract and many times investors used to do a reverse contract just to ensure that you know they don't have to pay the taxes on settlement. Mm -hmm. Now with this clarification to say that the tax will be levied on the difference between settlement price and strike price, I think it is very fair because then which means you are paying tax only on the economic gain okay. which will therefore give a boost to futures uh, options trading in the market. So I think that's a, it's a fair uh, amendment and a good development. Right. Another proposal that she made is on the relaxation for offshore fund managers yeah. in India. Do you think that will make India attractive? Uh, so I think you know there's been a demand from the industry in the last three, four years since the time, it's called a 9A, section 9A regime, right. since the time the law was introduced to make various relaxations. To my mind, the simplest way they could relax the whole thing is to align the income tax provisions with the SEBI provisions and say that once you're a SEBI registered FPI yeah. and you obviously fulfill the conditions as per the SEBI FPI regulations, yeah. you will automatically get the benefit of 9A. Yeah. But <coughs> for whatever reason, income tax law has its own set of conditions. Right. They, the government has tried to relax in the last two, three years yeah. certain conditions, so it has been made a little less harsher and more diluted. Mm. Uh, In this budget, one condition which I thought was important is they said that the payment made by the fund Mm. to the fund manager need not be at an arm's length or a transfer pricing based price, Mm. which I think is useful because if a tax officer or a transfer pricing officer makes an adjustment, that could have resulted in after a three year period denial of the benefit to the fund manager, So, which is a good relaxation. Mm. But then there are still various conditions for example, one of the conditions says that the investment of resident Indians right. in the offshore fund should not be more than 5%. Now, why should that condition be? Because in the FPI regulations, right. residents are allowed to invest up to 50%. Right. Similarly, there's a condition which says that the fund should not invest more than 20% of its money in a single company. Mm-hmm. Again, SEBI regulations don't restrict So, you think uh, these are kind of... Uh, these are roadblocks, yeah. which are discouraging more and more players to make use of this wonderful amendment under 9A mm-hmm. and I think once SEBI and income tax regulations are aligned, we will see more interest from fund managers. Okay. okay. So my last question is uh, on the regulatory uh, you know, changes that has been proposed, what's your take? Yeah, so uh, on the regulatory side, uh, we heard some good announcements from the okay. FM in her speech. Uh, for example, she said that uh, the cap up to which an FPI can invest okay will be increased from 24% yeah. up to the sectoral cap. Now that's a good development because many times we see 
that companies would increase the limit from 24 up to a certain percentage mm. or they may not increase so you are kind of restricted to that but once you go up to the sectoral cap which is 49 74 100 mm. then you fps can automatically therefore invest more mm. so i would expect some more inflows coming so in the market. So any estimation you have made uh, what kind of money would be uh, expected? No, not really. I mean, I don't have some, I don't want to risk putting some numbers. Uh, it's very difficult to do that because the other pro point is that a promoter or a company mm. can, by passing a board resolution, reduce that. So they can now okay. go reverse and reduce so that. That can be challenged below. So it by can the be, promoter. Yeah, okay. exactly. Okay. So therefore, I don't want to put a number, but I think it's a good relaxation. The second is, which I think a lot of deliberation has been going on and uh, I know about it maybe more than a little bit more than others because I was a part of the HR Khan committee right. and this was uh, taken as part of our uh, committee recommendation mm -hmm. is to merge the NRI route with the FPI route. Right. Now that I think will be a good impetus be <coughs> because today with the NRI route being there and the FPI route also and certain conditions attached for NRI investment in FPIs. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of kind of you know a push and pull, mm -hmm. and NRIs don't get the full freedom to invest in whatever way they want through an FPI route. Mm -hmm. So I think once both the routes are merged, mm -hmm. all the conditions will go away. Mm -hmm. NRIs will be able to use the fund uh, route, FPI route. They'll be able to use the services of professional fund managers, mm -hmm. and naturally for a fund manager of an Indian origin, based in Hong Kong, Singapore, or India, mm -hmm. their first point port of call is the NRI community, right? right? Because they know the NRI, the NRI community knows the Indian market much right. more. So I think it's a good boost and a good red carpet welcome to the NRI community. And uh, there are certain inherent advantages of using an FPR route, mm -hmm. tax point of view, regulatory point of view, right. which automatically the community will get. Right. So that's a good development. The third one which caught my eye is her announcement on the relaxation of KYC norms right. for FPIs. Again, uh, a much needed uh, boost because if you compare India with some other jurisdictions, then investors always feel that you know the KYC norms in India are much more harsher mm. than other countries. Mm. The government, it seems, you know, from her speech, is seriously looking at how they relax the conditions. Mm. And I think that again should see we should see more more and more funds wanting to then register, depending on how, of course, the relaxations right. are made. Right. Thanks, Mr. Gandhi. That was insightful. So, a lot of clarity on how to read the tax proposals uh, made by Finance Minister Nirmala Sitharaman on the budget day. We'll have to wait and uh, watch how the market reacts uh, in, in the coming days. Uh, thanks for watching. For more details, stay tuned.